So um, this is a really, really special moment for me because Anthony Wood is, is one of my favorite entrepreneurs ever. And, and I think he has a story that more people should hear. It's a very unique story. It's not the typical entrepreneur journey, but obviously he's been very successful. Roku has 80 million active users, a $9 billion market cap, and they've streamed 100 billion minutes. Is it minutes? Hours. Hours, 100 billion hours. So 60X larger than that. Um, so the thing that I wanted to explore first, Anthony, was just your kind of unique journey as an entrepreneur. Can you tell everyone what, how you came up with the name Roku? Because I think that'll take us in that direction. Sure. Um, well, Roku means six in Japanese, because it was my sixth company, uh, which I don't know. Some, sometimes feel like some people think, oh, that's cool. You started six companies. But that just means the first five you know, we're not as big as they should have been. So. Well, see, this is the part that I think is unique. Um, you know, you see a lot of 22, 23-year-old Zuckerberg types, um, but, but you don't see people who have been in there doing it for the whole, the whole of their career, and then obviously to have a hit of this size um, on your sixth one is pretty remarkable. Can you, do you remember the first five? Yeah. Can you hit them quickly? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, the, the name came from uh, me and my wife, Susan, were, were having uh, dinner in a Japanese restaurant in Palo Alto, and I was like, I was trying to think of a name for my next company, and I thought, and it's actually my, sort of my fifth company, it depends how you count, um, but uh, so I was talking, to, I asked the uh, wait, waitress, like, what is, what is five in Japanese? She said, oh, that's Go, and, but Go was this failed Silicon Valley tech company, so I was like, no, that's not going to work. What, what's like six in Japanese? And so, By the way, there's a great book about Go called Startup that I would encourage everyone to read. You're, you're probably the only other person in the room that remembers <laughs> Go. Um, uh, but anyways, so it's like Roku, and I was like, oh, that's cool. So um, yeah, so, so number one was in high school. I tried to start a company. I sold one copy of the software I wrote for $10. Um, I still had the check because I didn't cash it because I didn't have a bank account. So. Um, that was number one. Number two was um, in college. I started a company doing. Um, Anthony went to a different Texas university. That's yeah, I went to Texas A&M. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, yeah, so I, I, I started a company there. And what I learned, what I learned at that company is it's impossible to be in college and have a company at the same time. Like, they send you letters telling you they're going to kick you out of school for not having good grades, and. Um, and so I basically decided, and I was, I made, you know, I got, like, I started with nothing, uh, like I had a few dollars I'd made working, and I built that up to, you know, millions of dollars a year in revenue, and I was making good money for a college student, but it wasn't like, you know, like Michael Dell or Bill Gates, so I just, I, I felt I'd regret not getting my degree, so I basically kind of shut that down, went back to school for another year, graduated in double E, and then loaded up my U-Haul and moved, moved to Silicon Valley, and I took, I took the money I'd made from that, and I started another company doing kind of basically the same thing, which was uh, digital audio editing systems for video production. Um, and that, that was very profitable. I made a few million dollars doing that. And then, but the company, the, 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 the computer that we, had, we were building it for was called the Commodore Amiga. I don't know if any people remember that, but they went out of business. And um, so I said, okay, let's, good. yeah, they went out of business. So I was like, well, that's a shame. And uh, decided, well, we, so I'll just shut that company down. I restarted immediately a new company called iBand. And I thought the internet, this was in 95, I think, and the internet was getting popular. And I thought this internet thing's going to be big. I'll do software for the internet. So I wrote internet authoring software. And um, nine months later, sold it for $35 million. So I was like, wow, that's, how, that's a lot better. That's a lot less work. So. Um, <laughs> So that was now you could have just stopped there. That's plenty of, of, of coin. Yeah, but I was like 30, and I I didn't I didn't want to stop. Like I was having fun, and um, and I you know I'd always wanted to take a company public. It was sort of a goal of mine. So I um, so then I took the money from that, and I started a company called Replay TV, which was the first DVR we invented. The DVR, uh, and that's I learned a lot of hard lessons. That was a <laughs> Although it eventually got sold for, I think it got sold for 100, 175 million dollars or something like that. It was, it was not really a success. It, you know, it, it went out. Of, it ended up getting sold because the of the dot com crash. And as we met, you actually allowed me to make an angel investment in Replay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I've known Bill for a, a long time, and um, yeah, when I was raising money for 
replay. I, Bill was an investor. Uh, I didn't. We never. I didn't know you before, uh, but I got you to invest hundred thousand dollars. And Bill doesn't remember, but he lost all of it. He just uh, reminded me backstage. <laughs> 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 okay. So. Um, yeah. And so replay obviously was was. I mean, the, the DVR war with TiVo. Like this was this was a big stage, even if you didn't have. Yeah. that outcome. And so um, what's the napkin story for Roku? What, what led you, especially with replay having been in that category, some people might be like, I meet entrepreneurs who fail in a category, they blame it on the category, you know, like that's too hard. You turned around and ran right at it. They blame it on the category? Some do. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, well, I blame that on the stock market, so. Uh, okay. <laughs> but because anyway, the uh, well, the story for for replay TV was, um, I mean, I, it's kind of interesting. I think I think it was you know basically I my prior companies had built technology sort of around around television stuff, but more for professionals. Um, and I I'd always felt and I used to. This is how the DVR was invented. I used to um, go home and. I watched Star Trek The Next Generation back then, and I recorded it on my RCA video tapes, uh, and it was hard. You know, like I could never remember what tape it was on, and I could, you know, what, where is it? I mean, all, you have no idea, but it's hard to record TV on video cassette tapes. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, and um, so that was like, oh, well, I should, you know, I should make a little computer, I should make th some of the hard drive, and it'll be a lot easier. And uh, so I'd always, I'd had that e idea for a while, and then, uh, but hard drives were expensive and compression technology was expensive. And so I just sort of used to look at the prices of hard drives and one day I realized, oh, it's getting to the point where you could build a DVR. It wasn't called DVR back then, it was called personal television. And um, so that, and, and you know, and there's lots of problems with building a company around a DVR. It's, a hard, it's primarily a hardware product and it's really hard to raise money for, these days it's a little bit easier, but <clears throat> even today, unless you have some kind of service business model, like it's very yeah. hard to raise money around a hardware company. So it's hard to, so I, I thought, well, at least I'll get a DVR. I can watch Star Trek. So, <clears throat> so anyway, so I started this DVR company and was successful in raising money. And, but I always felt like um, that the DVR was just like the stepping stone to when streaming would, would eventually happen. So, so I'd always wanted to do streaming uh, and it just, you know, we can talk about what, the, but essentially Netflix was the, the thing that made streaming. You know, the timing, of course, is super important, but they were the, like, the killer app for streaming, basically. So, so you were literally taking another shot on goal. The same problem, technology's evolved a bit, don't need the hard drive. That, that's why you went back at it. Yeah, I felt like I hadn't accomplished what I wanted to do with replay, which was to make it easy to watch television. So, so yeah. tell people, give, give, for those that might not know, tell them what Roku is today. Like, I might call it a, a, a on-demand TV OS of sorts, but. Yeah, well, I mean, probably half the people in this room have a Roku. It's, a, it's used by about half of broadband households in America it's, uh, to watch television. It's, um, of course, so people think of Roku as the TVs we sell, we're the number one selling uh, Roku TVs, they're number one selling TVs in the United States. They have been for the last five years. That's amazing. Um, and also, uh, you know, we also make streaming players. They're very popular. So consumers think of us as sort of this hardware company that makes TVs and streaming players. But, but we don't make any money selling TVs and streaming players. We, we lose money on that side of our business. And uh, we make all our money on services. So basically, um, advertising and streaming service distribution. So we distribute all, you know, all television is moving to streaming and it's on services like Netflix and Amazon Prime and, you know, Hulu and YouTube and all those services are, we distribute those services. You know, sort of a little bit like the way cable companies distribute uh, television programming and networks, we distribute streaming services. We get paid for that in a variety of ways. And then also advertising is a huge, a huge business for us. We, um, we're one of the top uh, streaming advertising platforms in the country, and uh, there's a lot of free content that we license to make available to our viewers, our customers, and then they watch it for free, and then we put ads in it. So we have a, a very large ad business as well. Like many product-oriented founders, I know you're passionate about product. What are the elements 
of Roku that on the product side that you, you think you'd really nailed that differentiated it and allowed it to get this big and popular? Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, I th there's a, a few things that have made us successful. So I think maybe at the core, this is, I mean, well, I'll just, before I get to the core, I'll just say, you know, we put a lot of effort into our brand, building products that are simple to use, delightful, and I think, I think we have, I know we've, we've done a good job at that, and um, consumers love that, viewers love that, and so we're known for having those little simple, you know, fun boxes. And that's a big part of our brand, it's a big part of why we're successful. Customers want Roku, they buy one, and they want more in their house. But, but really, the core of why we're successful was, if you just think, we're an operating system for television, basically, the same way, you know, Windows is an operating system for laptops, and Android is an operating system for phones. And if you, if, you just, if you just think about operating systems strategically, <clears throat> you know, you go back to, there was, you know, there were mainframes, they had whatever it was, OS, OS 360, something, OS something from IBM, and then, uh, but they, IBM did not become the PC operating system, it became DOS and Windows, because it was purpose built for that platform, for that ecosystem, for that cost structure, uh, and it was a new market. And so the legacy companies, they didn't make that transition. Windows became the number one operating system. And then when phones became computing platforms. Um, you know, Windows tried, they made a phone operating system. No one here's using it. They're using Android, which was designed specifically for that platform. So when we start, when we said, well, when, we're gonna, when we build our TV operating system, we'll build an operating system designed specifically for TVs. And so we built, an, we're the only company actually, there's other, we have competitors, but they're all taking their phone operating systems or their PC operating systems and ported them to TVs. We built an operating system from the ground up for TVs. And it just has, and that's how every other prior operating system won, and that's why we're number one in the US. And so, you know, there's specifics, like, well, what's different about a purpose-built operating system? There's a lot of differences, but a big one is cost. <clears throat> you know, um, in the TV business, cost, the TVs is a, a brutally cost-competitive business. and. Um, you know, no one makes money on TVs except maybe, um, I don't know, maybe retailers. Make, even retailers don't make money on TVs. They sell them as lost leaders to get you in the store. So it's incredibly cost competitive. I remember we were, in, we, we were competing for a deal at Walmart one year. And, you know, Black Friday is a big time for selling TVs. And so you, you get your Black Friday deals, you know, nine months ahead of time. And you, you compete with other companies to get those deals. And to get, we ended up getting this, we won this deal at Walmart. We sold... I don't know, like probably a million TVs on Black Friday at Walmart to do this, a deal like this. And, but to win that deal, <clears throat> we, we agreed to redesign the Wi-Fi circuitry on the TV to use a, a chip that was 25 cents less expensive. And that's how we got the, that's how we got the deal. <laughs> so, you know, it's just, it's really price competitive. And so what we did, one of the things we did is we built software that runs on lower cost hardware. I mean, it's pretty simple. Like if you have a, a phone, for example, it's like a supercomputer. It's got gigabytes of RAM. You know, it costs five hundred dollars to build a phone. I mean, a, a TV main board is twenty-five dollars to build. And I understand so. you made some hard calls on the remote. By the way, my favorite feature is the microphone on the remote. Like, I do everything like fast forward and everything. It's just amazing by talking to it. Um, and you can pick specific minutes and stuff which you couldn't do with a button. You talk to your remote? Yeah, all the time. Okay. <laughs> Am I the only one? <laughs> but um, there are other things, right, on the remote? I'd heard some stories. There's a lot of innovation uh, along the way, for sure. Innovation is a key. Um, the remote was a huge innovation point. Um, uh, the biggest innovation on the remote, uh, and everyone does it now, but we, but we pioneered this, was there's, there's way less buttons on the remote. I mean, it used to be, and it still is for some TVs, you get like a million buttons on the remote. <laughs> right. Our button has, a, I don't know how many, but it's got a very small number of buttons there's no number buttons. Like that was a huge, like, oh, we're gonna make a TV with no number buttons, that's crazy. And so, you know, we made just less buttons on the remote and everyone started copying us. Um, another big innovation, you don't think of it as big, but back when we shipped the first streaming player, 17, all, the, all, the, all the TV equipment was 17 inches wide. Like that was sort of like you build it 17 inches wide to prove that it was worth the money. And we, we, made, it, we made it as small as we could make it. And we had the first small, for small streaming player, it's one of the reasons people loved it. And then we invented the streaming stick, where we made it the size of a little stick that you plug in the size of the in TV. Port, yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, one thing that 
when, you know, as a venture capitalist, when I think about the model that you executed, in, in addition to it being a tough category, because you made the business model on things that require scale, you had, like before you were gonna deliver the type of revenue that could get you to break even, you had to get millions and millions of customers with a loss leader on hardware. It's pretty bold. You're not afraid of that? Well, is it really bold? I mean, isn't that what, isn't that what venture capitalists do? You invest in, <laughs> you invest in money losing companies so they can be- Money losing companies? I'm not sure that's the objective. But. Not, 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 not forever, <laughs> but when, they, when you invest, they're not making money. Sure, um, sure, but, it, but and, and we do social media companies that require that same kind of um, scale, but the, the hardware loss to get there, that's, that's pretty- uh, So, well, I, um, it's not, well, it's not that bad because actually maybe we lose money in hardware today. We didn't lose money when we first started shipping it. Like the way we financed the company early on was we, we had like 25% gross margins on the hardware. So, you know, we, as, as, as scale started to grow and as we start to make money on the hardware, you know, through services, then it, then it, made, it made sense that. to lower the price of the hardware to get more scale because you knew that if you lost $5 on a box, but you made $50 from that customer, it's well worth losing $5. And yeah. so it wasn't, that way, it wasn't that way early on, but it became that way. Um, so we actually, we actually financed a big part of the company on hardware at the, at the beginning. But for sure, the whole bet was that you, you got to have scale before you can start making money on advertising and things like that. This, but I mean, I guess this is the, maybe the bold part, like we built an operating system for TV, like operating, you don't, there's no operating systems with 5% market share. Like you, <laughs> you have to become number one or number two to build an yeah. operating system business. And so, um, yeah, maybe that was. A uh, few more Roku questions and then, then I want to talk about the streaming industry. Um, you already hit it on this a little bit when you talked about the, um, specialization for the platform, but you're competing against companies like Google and Amazon. Mm -hmm. And most people that try that don't end up with a $9 billion public company. They end up with something a little less. Um, how, in, like, is that intimidating? Is there, is it, is it, is it like, uh, are you proud that you're able to be successful? But, you know, <laughs> that's also daunting. Yeah, I'd say it's annoying. <laughs> um, the, I, I think, well, first of all, of course, if you, you cannot be successful building a search company and competing with Google, that's not gonna work. But that's not, we didn't build a search company, we built a TV operating system company and they weren't, it wasn't their core business. And they right. weren't, and so, um, and if you, look at, if you look at those companies, when they were smaller, I mean, they had big competitors. I mean, Yahoo had Yahoo. And so it's, it's and I'll go back to the Windows example where they built an operating system for PCs when they had IBM was a huge competitor. I mean, if you have, if there's a transition in the industry where, where everything is changing, uh, I think startups have an advantage because they can move quicker, they can build purposeful solutions, they don't have incumbent businesses they have to protect. Like, yeah. you just have fundamental advantages. And um, so when we started, and, and, and focus, like, you know, if you're Google, you go to work every day trying to build the best search product, and maybe they got a team working on TVs, but, I mean, they don't put their smartest people on TVs. They put them on search. And so, um, Good point. so I think, I think um, yeah, I don't think when you're, when you're starting something new, if it's a new category, a new business, it doesn't matter if big companies try and do it. They can't. Well, if you go back to, the, if you go back to like the DVR business, and it was TiVo and us, you know, actually having a startup as a competitor was hard because they, they had all the same advantages we had, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The, um, talk a little bit about the hardware, how the hardware business evolved. So you mentioned your success with embedded in the TV. My wife and I bought several of these and the usability is just unbelievable. It boots to Roku. I mean, you turn the TV on and it's right. there, especially if you've cut the cord and you're, you're on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, so, so you've had that success and I assume you're negotiating with, with OEM partners to get that done. And then, and then you've had a, a, a new piece of information, I guess, with Walmart buying Vizio. So how, how, how is that part of the business evolving? <clears throat> um, let's see, so there's a lot of questions there. So the, uh, the TV, so we sell Roku TVs. It's the, you know, it used to be we primarily, most people were, got a Roku streaming player or a streaming stick. 
Uh, now most people get a Roku th by buying a Roku TV, so that transition has happened. Um, and it How was, many different OEMs do you work with? Uh, a lot. I don't know. Um, 20. So, um, and a lot of factories. Uh, you know, the way the TV business is structured actually is, um, I mean, it's a complicated question, but one of the interesting things about the TV business is TV companies don't make TVs. Like, um, you would think they do, but they don't. Like, one, <clears throat> it turns out, like, when we, when we started licensing our platform to, um, a TV company, to TV companies, we were like, oh, well, we'll just focus on the software. They know how to make TVs. And the picture was bad, like, you know. And it just turns out that um, other than Samsung, uh, every other TV company gets all their technology from someone else. So they get it from their chip company, usually. And these days, they get it from Roku. Like, we're, a, we're one of the few TV companies in the world. So we, we build everything. We design. So you have a spec design and everything. We design everything. We design the hardware. We design the software. We, yeah. we do the picture quality, the audio quality. We have audio specialists. We, we do the marketing. Like, we get them placed at retail. Like, we do everything except put the brand. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, and so that's one of the, so that's one of the ways you're successful, is they need, like, we do, like if you want to sell TVs, you got a factory. They, what they have is factories, it turns out. And they have a full employment program for, you know, Asian workers in factories. And uh, so you go to them and say, well, we got a deal for, with Walmart. We can sell you two million TVs. Would you like to build them? Like, sure, we'll build TVs. So, <laughs> so, you know, you go to them with the complete solution. That's one of the, one of the ways you win. And then helping them with the retail distribution. I mean, the Walmart deal, the Walmart announcement, if, if people haven't heard of it, they're buying Vizio, which is another TV company. Um, and, you know, I, but I think that, I mean, we have a great relationship with Walmart. They'll keep selling Roku TVs. Right, they don't but, have exclusive. They're not going to go uh, exclusive. And people love, people buy Roku, Roku TVs because they love Roku. They love our brand, you know. They love the simplicity, the delight. We sold, we sold, we added 10 million active accounts last year and, and sold 20 million devices, 10 million TVs, and we'll sell, we'll sell a lot more TVs this year. The um, one last thing on, on Roku. So you've spoken recently about a desire to move beyond the TV into other aspects of, of perhaps home automation. Can you talk about that a bit or what you're thinking? Yeah, well, I just, if we just back up for a second, I mean, a big focus for me this year is, is, is growth. I mean, last year, one of my big focuses was um, just our cost, you know, during the whole COVID cycle, uh, like a lot of companies, our costs had gotten sort of out of balance with our revenue, even though revenue was still growing. Um, so a lot of focus on operational efficiencies and costs last year. This year, we're not, me and my team are much more focused on um, revenue growth. And, um, and there's lots of ways to go revenue. I mean, one is, uh, you know, just look at adding more accounts. I mean, we have 80 million households basically using Roku, but, there's you know billions of broadband households around the world, and so and there's still most countries are still early in that transition. So we're still focused on growing account. Even in the U.S., there's still lots of room to grow our account base. Um, How many other countries are you in? Uh, we're the number one streaming platform in the U.S. We're the number one in Can Canada. We're number one in Mexico. We're we'll be number one soon in all of Latin America. Um, and then we're in the U.K. We're doing well there. Uh, Germany, and then you know we'll keep expanding. So. International is a big focus for us for, for growth. And then uh, advertising is a, is a huge part. Of, well, streaming service, one of the uh, streaming service distribution is a big focus for us. And there's lots of ways we continue to grow our streaming services. Advertising, if you look at advertising, I mean, we're at a point now where about almost 60% of viewing, TV viewing is on streaming, but only about 30% of TV ad dollars are on streaming. So there's, there's still a bunch of traditional TV ad dollars that are gonna shift to streaming. You know, taking advantage of that and managing that transition. And then a big focus for us, you know, if you just think about like what's the core asset that Roku has that no one else has, it's the Roku customers. So, you know, 80 million households, that's, I don't know, 150 million people that turn on their TV every day to, and they see the Roku home screen. And so they start their, their, so that they start their TV journey from the Roku home screen, sort of taking advantage of that to help viewers, like before they, a viewer decides what they want to watch, helping them pick something to watch is a huge focus for us. And just, there's, we start, and you see that in things like, um, we launched something called the Sports 
all things sports recently, which is an area you can go to and to find out what games are playing or where to watch a game because sports rights are fragmented across the entire yeah. steaming ecosystem. People don't know where to find games. So we help, all get told about a show we love and we have no idea where, which service it's Right, on. so anyway, so, that, so taking advantage of that home screen ownership and, and uh, another thing we did that's super cool is we have a screensaver called Roku City that the New York Times wrote an article about. It's become this sort of cultural phenomena um, uh, it's a cool screen saver, uh, but we we added we, we we in terms of like growing revenue growth, we added buildings to Roku City, and we started selling buildings. So we sold a building to McDonald's, and you know we, we sold buildings to a lot of companies. So virtual buildings in Roku. City. Uh, yeah, they're not real buildings. <laughs> they're fake. Buildings. And then I started that question. You, you told us a lot, but you didn't get to the punchline on just moving beyond the TV. Oh yeah, sorry. That's right. One of the growth areas we're looking at is smart home. So if you think about like, like smart homes, you know, it's not particularly new, but it, no one's solved it. Like it's complicated. Was this cameras and door locks and that kind of thing? Or? Uh, yeah, and control. Like, you know, if you're if you're wealthy, lighting. if you're wealthy, you have like a, a Crestron lighting system or or, or Lutron or Crestron. Right, right, right. Or, but like taking that sort of features and bringing it down to so it's broader just market. Ev the entire yeah, everywhere. And, and I think the way to to like a mass market. And I think the way to solve that to win in that. I really think there's going to be an offering, just like there's operating systems for smart TVs, there's going to be an operating system for your house. Smart home. And no one, no one has built an operating system for your house, like with an app store. And Other than these high-end things. No, those aren't, those aren't operating systems. Those are, those, are, those are cameras. Okay. Fair enough. Those are different. Um, let's talk about the streaming industry. So um, you bet on cord cutting and the transition to streaming before it happened. Has it happened? Is it over? Is it, uh, is it done? Streaming? Yeah. No. As, as the primary, you said 60% 60, 60 of, of viewing hours is now streaming? Yeah, in the US, but not globally. Globally, it's way smaller. I mean, most of the world still are antennas. And, um, there's still, there's, there's a lot of things happening. There's a lot of things happening in the streaming industry right now, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that are gonna happen, for sure. Um, you know, I think if you just sort of look at the trends that are happening in streaming right now, um, you know, one, the big trend that happened a couple of years ago was all the major media companies launched streaming services. They're not making any money on those streaming services. Like Netflix is the only, well, and YouTube. Netflix and YouTube are the only ones that make money on streaming services. Uh, but everyone rushed in. So, I mean, this whole notion of the golden age of television, which was true three years ago, and they were all investing billions, right? Yeah. In content creation. Yep, so, so they all rushed in, um, <clears throat> but, but now, and so one of the trends now is they're trying to make money. And so one, one of the ways that you do make money in, in TV traditionally is you start putting ads in your TV show. So, you know, so now it's, so now everyone's adding ad supported tier. So that's the big trend we're seeing. Amazon asked me to pay money to not transition to an ad supported tier. Mm -hmm. I thought I already had that, but anyway. <laughs> um, yep. Yeah. They're probably one of the ones making money, actually. Yeah. Uh, okay, so ads, ad, advertising is a big trend. So you know, that's a lot of a lot of stuff we're focused on is helping as services transition to advertising, helping them be successful with that. And there's a lot. And one of the big things is just engagement. You know, if you have um, if you have ads in your in your in your TV shows, you want more. The more people watch the ad, the more more you can sell the ads for. And so, um, and the one of the best ways to get to get people to watch your TV show with an ad, and it is to put an ad on a Roku home screen, for example. So there's lots of, that's a very simple, simple way, but there's lots of things around ads. Um, another big trend that's right now, which is really, I was surprised by, is what the industry calls is fast channels. So these are um, basically linear television, but on streaming, and it's just exploded. Like everyone's launching fast channels. Fast channels are basically, it's a, it's a bad name, but it just means like, uh, it just means like a TV channel, but on streaming instead of on the linear, a linear, a linear stream channel. channel. Yeah, I mean, because when streaming first came out, it was all it was only on demand. On demand. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, well, that's a much better way to watch TV. Why would you watch linear channels? But it turns out, less people don't want to decide what to watch. They just want to flip on a channel, let it play. So that's huge. Um, that's a big driver of growth for us. Actually, is um, we're the biggest fast channel distributor. Um, um, so you know, and then. Um, there's still another big trend that's happening in the industry right now is, is consolidation. So consolidation both of operating systems, like companies trying to make their own operating system, like 
the reason Vizio got sold, for example, is because of this consult. Like you can't, you can't be a, you can't be a, you can't have five percent market share and survive in this in the operating system business. And so, so consolidation operating systems is, is driving our business, but also consolidation of streaming services. So, you know. Um, you know, basically everyone is either wants to become part of Netflix or they want to be, you know, all the streaming services are, are emerging. One of the, and one of the things I think people don't realize is one of the aggregators of streaming services is our platforms like Roku. So we have, we aggregate a lot of content into, uh, into our UI and we provide a lot of the services for these streaming services. So like even, you know, as small as like say Stars or Showtime, but also up to, you know, Paramount Plus, like we'll integrate you into the, directly into the UI, we'll aggregate the, we'll aggregate the billing, we'll integrate the viewing, and that just lowers the cost and it allows these streaming services to survive instead of merging with one of the other companies. What to, you have a, it's funny because everyone theoretically saw this coming, the world talked about it coming, and yet for the companies that were accustomed to the linear stack, there have been stumbles, like ESPN is, is notably had its first major stumble since, you know, t two or three decades of prominence. And, and now there's this weird story that like three of the networks want to start a new sports channel. Uh, is, is there a reason it's easier to start from scratch than have the legacy thing? And what, what's going on there? Well, <clears throat> I mean, uh, um, you know, the traditional TV in the United States, pay TV is basically a monopoly. And uh, you know, there's only one, I mean, there's not just, you have satellite and cable, you know, you got yeah. a couple options, but, but basically you have local monopolies for distribution. And <clears throat> the result of that was, and, and everything was bundled into this one pay package. The result of all that is very profitable for the, the studios. You know, they made a lot of money in the traditional pay model. Um, and in the streaming world, there's just a lot more competition and it's not a monopoly. Uh, and so they just have, they just make less money. I mean, they don't talk about it a lot, but there's just less money for, if you're an incumbent, moving from a, basically a monopoly to a very competitive world, <clears throat> uh, there's just less money. So, um, so th they're- So you combine out of fear? You create this three-headed JV? Yeah, exactly. They're, they're, they're merging and they're trying to figure out what to do and they want to, they all have Netflix envy. They want to start a, you know, a, a streaming service as popular as Netflix. And, um, even though you know they waited too long, like they they could have they could have done it they yeah. a long time ago. But anyway, so uh, yeah, so that so there's they're trying a lot of different things, and one of them is the sports service you just mentioned, um, where they're taking all their linear channels that are on pay TV that have sports rights, and they're combining them into a virtual pay TV service, this sports centric pay TV service, and that's. Um, it's good. I mean, it's good for viewers. It gives them more options. It gives them more options to choose from. Uh, it's great for Roku because we'll be a, their biggest distributor by far, and we and they'll buy a lot of promotion on our platform. So um, that's a great great outcome, I think. And then I guess the other big thing in the industry is getting these ad dollars moved over, which which you already spoke about. But I assume that's one of your primary objectives. To move the ad dollars over. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, to get, they're following the streaming, but to, to do the things that allow that to happen. Yeah, that's a, I mean, I think that's a good point. I mean, if you think about, um, I mean, there's this weird dynamic where TV buyers are just sort of used, or TV advertising buyers are just used to buying TV ads a certain way, and they've done that for a long time. Um, uh, so, but their viewers move to streaming, but they still buy ads on traditional linear TV. So, anything that sort of gets them to move their dollars over is good for, is good for the industry and our business and this Let, this will be let's that. switch to ai so first real quick the easy answer talk about how you're using ai internally at roku both for either product or optimization and then we'll go to the the bigger creative question sure well i mean you know uh, companies like roku are, our software is, is ai is embedded throughout it, throughout the software stack so you, th you like the remote that you can talk to? Well, that's AI. I mean, natural language recognition is, is entirely AI-based. Um, voice recognition, natural language processing. 10X better than Siri, by the way. That's a low bar, but like. Well, it's a little side story, but when, when, we, dis when we decided to do voice, like when, when Google personal assistants came out and, and um, you know, Alexa, we thought about it and said, oh, should we add those to our product? And we said, no, we'll, what we want to do is because we don't. People, we decided people don't want to. Because again, we're focused on like delighting our viewers. Very simple. We think people don't really want to 
have long conversations with their television. They just really want to watch television. And so, so we thought about like, well, let's just focus on in the TV context, how can you build the best voice recognition? So it's a much simpler problem. Like, yes. like I want to search for a movie. Let's just be really good at searching for movies. And so that's, I want to enter my credit card number without typing it in. So those are sort of the things we focus on. And so we have a good, good solution. Um, but AI, AI is, you know, advertising is all targeted advertising. It's all AI-based. AI all our, all our um, recommendations for all our TV shows are all AI-based. So AI, the recommendation engine, targeting, uh, it's all throughout, the, throughout the, the platform. Now, the big question. So, and there's a lot of creators here at South by. The, the, there are people that, that go on podcasts and things and say, you know, oh, did you see this latest open AI release? People are just going to make their own movies, and everyone will be in the business. Where, where, where do you fall on whether that, how far that is from reality? And what have you seen? I think some of that's going to happen. I mean, uh, it's the question of timing, and not all, not all of it. Um, so, you know, when I when we think about AI as a business, um, I think about it as, as sort of in like it's called three categories. One is just, I think, the category that people don't appreciate, that, which I think is just using AI to improve business operations. Like, if you don't do that, you're gonna go out of business. So, you know, like customer care, you can make customer care much There's less expensive. There's this famous Klarna thing that got out oh, what, sorry? two weeks ago. It's just that they, they gave a bunch of stats on customer service. Uh, yeah, so like, it's, just cl it's an easy example, but like you can lower your costs, you can make service better. But even just like, Inventory management, like we build millions of things a year. Cost, you know, if it takes, if we end up ordering too few or too many, we have to ship them by plane instead of boat, it's super expensive, like it's yeah. millions and millions of dollars. And so um, if you can do better predictions, so just better operations, if you can improve your operations five or 10% by using AI, you're gonna stand, stay in business and your competitors are gonna go out of business. So, I, that's, so that's one category is just using it for business. Um, but I think the interesting. But can you make movies? Can you make movies? Yeah, for that's free. a real question for free. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can certainly impersonate actors. You know, you can certainly build models that look like an actor and sound like an actor, but are not an actor. Um, but how do, how, do you ha do you have an opinion on whether this will drastically change the content creation business? Um, yes, it will drastically change the content creation business, but I don't think it's right away. I think it's, it's, it'll be. 10 years, but it'll slowly, like there's a lot of ways to improve. Um, like, well, I think one example is, say, okay, well, can you make a movie with AI? So we, ha we have an advanced development team. We, should, we told them, go make a movie with AI. Let's, let's watch this movie, see what it looks like. And um, so they, they went out and they said, they, they, they used AI to write a script. Like, I don't know if they use chat GPT or something like that, but you can, you can get a script from yeah. AI. And then, and then they said, okay, they use some other tool to generate um, the video from the script, and they use some other tool to generate the audio from the script. And, th and they had to sort of help it, you know, like tie the pieces together. But the app was a, it was a movie, and it was generated entirely by AI. And the video, the video was generated by AI. The audio was generated by AI. And it wasn't a very good movie. Um, but, it, but it was like, it was scary. Like, wow, you know, you can just imagine that in 10 years. So I think it will get better. And I think for sure it's a tool that you're, if, you're, if you're in the creative production business, you can use this as a tool to become much more efficient. And that's gonna happen immediately, I think. Right, and that's the correlation with, with what you said before. Let's switch to um, just having done six companies, you must have tons of lessons learned along the way. If you were giving entrepreneurs your three best pieces of advice, what would you tell them? Only three? Well, we can do more, but let's start with three. Um, let's see, so, um, I think that, um, like, if you're going to start a company, one of the things I've learned is the, the other people in the company are very important. Like, you have to get the best talent you know you can you can get to help you. Like, it's, it's super critical. And um, I, I, what I've learned is it doesn't mean like you, you can only get the talent level that's appropriate for your stage. Like, you're not going to get if you're a startup little company, you're not going to get someone that's making $2 million a year at a big company to come work for, I mean, you might, but you're probably not. So, you, you, but you need to focus on, but there's certain kinds of, there's a pool of people that want to have that job. You need to find the best people possible. And so that's super important. It also, um, you know, persistence I've learned, like um, things don't usually work out the first time. And so 
most successful people. Some people get lucky and they're successful right away, but that's, I think, more, most, more commonly is you just have to be very persistent. And that's, to me, that's the hardest one because, you know, a lot of things don't work out. And so if you're persistent for too long, you're wasting your time. And so yeah. how, when you decide like that, and so no one can decide for you, but, but you've got to be persistent, but you can't be persistent for too long because then you're going to waste your time. So that's the hard one. With, and, with six stars, you might be the king of persistence. <laughs> um, and then the sixth one is, I think, or the third one is timing. So every, every product, every, you know, you sort of have to pick something where the time is right. Like it's not too early, it's not too late. And also, the, the market has to be big. If the market's not big, it, so those are three. Yeah, things. and that one's critical because a lot of these technologies are dependent on other pieces of technology being in place at the right time and the right moment. And there have been a lot of the famous, you know, Go and General Magic, where they had to do too many of the pieces because the rest of the pieces weren't there yet. And and, yeah. got, and, and if you get it just perfect where those pieces are coming together and you're three years ahead of the market, two years ahead of the market, then you have the type of success. Exactly. And it's hard to, it's hard to do. I'll, one, I'll give you an example. Like, um, this is a small one, but Roku, actually one of the first products we made, we made products before the streaming, the, the streaming players that made us super famous. We made a couple of products before that. And one of them was a streaming audio player. Um, and these days, everyone streams audio. Uh, but that, that was just an example of a product that was too early. I mean, it, we sold like 100,000, it was okay. You know, we sold some, but it wasn't a huge hit. People back then, they didn't stream audio. They just, they stole stuff on, they downloaded pirated iTunes, you know, stuff <laughs> and played it on iTunes. So, Napster. <laughs> yeah, Napster. But if we had, you know, if we'd done that product five years later, it probably would have been a big hit. Yeah, yeah. Any other, any other advice, tips, since I limited you to three? Um, well, I think you know what it takes to be successful really depends on lots of things, the size of the company and or sort of your aspirations. But if I, one thing I have noticed is if you if you're starting a technology company and you want to start a technology, I, what I, a lot of times what happens is I get people coming to me saying, you know, I want to start this company. How do I how do I do it? And they're a business person, like they they went to they went to business school. They didn't, they're not an engineer and. I've just realized if you're going to start a technology company, this doesn't apply to other companies, but a technology company, you have to be a, you basically have to be a technologist. And so if you want to, and so if you're not, it's going to be very hard. You, you need to, if you, you can do it, but you need to find a partner. You need to find someone who is a, because a lot of times you do get successful technology and business people teaming up and that can be successful, but you have to have the technology piece of it. Yeah, I've, I've I mean, it, th this became apparent two years into my venture career, but if you ever, me to start up and they say they've outsourced the development to a third party. You just yeah. like, you uh, know, that's all fast. Yeah. Like, just super right. fast. Yeah. I don't think I've ever, a company like that's ever succeeded. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another thing I've noticed is um, if you're going to start a company, it's a lot easier to do it when you're young. I mean, there's downsides, like you don't know anything. Like, um, Including you don't. That's an upside. No, exactly. Including, <laughs> including you don't know that it's not possible. Like I, right. I for sure some some of my successes. Like people, if I had known what I, I might never never tried it. So, you don't you don't understand how hard it is. And uh, but you got nothing nothing to lose. I mean, if you have a, if you get a, a, a job and you've into your career for five years and you're getting paid hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, and you start to have a family, it's hard to it's Kids hard in private school. Hard, yeah, you can't. It's hard. You can't just give that up. Exclusive so, resort to membership. Exactly. Exactly. You got <laughs> golf club I mean <laughs> but when you're 20 something and you don't have you have nothing you got nothing to lose yeah people say isn't it risky it's like no you got nothing to lose like, um and and I, I agree with that point um let's talk about Texas so you grew up in Texas I grew up in Texas we both recently moved back to Austin um, yeah didn't yeah never lived here in Austin before but you did something that I didn't do which is you you you've created a kind of second headquarter for the company and then, and then, you know, moved with it. And that's also very common these days. People are, are having struggles with um, scaling companies in Silicon Valley because of the competition and price and cost of living. Mm -hmm. um, talk about putting employees here, like how hard a transition that be, how successful has it been for you? What, what, what are the lessons learned on that front? <clears throat> it's been very successful. I mean, we, you know, Roku was started in San Jose, California, and uh, Silicon Valley, and we, 
quickly got to a point where we couldn't hire engineers fast enough. I mean, there's a lot of engineers there, but they all have jobs. So um, we, uh, and we, you know, we hired lots of engineers, but, but we opened offices in Austin. This was a while ago, probably, I don't remember, like 10 years ago. We opened an office in Austin, and we opened an office in Cambridge, UK, uh, both just to hire engineers faster. And there's a lot of great engineers in Austin, so that worked out really well for us. There's a lot of semiconductor talent, there's a lot of TV talent, turns out we do a lot of our TV development in Austin. Um, and, um, and so that, so, you know, we've got about, about 400 employees in Austin now. And we, then we started adding, we, and we've, we started adding other types of employees besides engineers. So that's worked out well for us. I moved out here. My, you know, the other thing about Roku though is they're pretty, we were very, uh, we have a lot of different business areas, like we do content, we do advertising, we do TVs, and so we have centers of excellence. Yeah, we have centers of excellence. So we have a pretty big office in LA around co content. We have a big office in New York around um, advertising, and, so, and then we got offices in Shanghai, in Asia, because we build lots of TVs over there. So uh, the result is that my senior team is distributed. It's not only one place. Oops. Could have been me. I don't know. Yeah. So, oh. uh, so, so it doesn't really matter where I'm at. So, uh, Boston's a great place. What, what, one thing I would state: a lot of, as, as since I've been back, a lot of people ask me, you know, what can, what can Austin do to to be more successful in the in the global, you know, tech space? And one thing that that I always point out is you got to get founders here. Like it's hard, you know, Google or Apple would put a customer support group here, but that's not going to bleed founders for new companies. Yeah. And one thing that I really, really am, am thankful for and impressed by is people like yourself coming here, Elon, obviously, um, a couple of enterprise companies, uh, Matthew Prince at Cloudflare has started to put a lot of employees here at Lassian. I think this is their second highest. And so it's a next wave after the, the, the big guys and you're seeing more engineering. And so I, I think that's gonna be really, really helpful. So uh, the city appreciates what you're doing. And I think just having people like yourself here is going to attract more people like that. Yeah. Um, since you've been successful, I know that you've launched a foundation and, and you've got some very important initiatives there. How are you thinking about, you know, giving back and what are the areas that are most important to you? <clears throat> yeah, so we, we, um, we give a fair amount to philanthropy. You know, we have, the areas we focus on, one is... Um, uh, just like poverty alleviation, mostly focused on trying to prevent, uh, to helping kids make good choices so they don't end up poor, you know, so after school programs, things like that. We give money to mental health and homelessness. That's, you know, homelessness is a, I think, intractable problem. There's no good solution. You can help sort of on the edges because people have to, you know, you can't, I mean, anyone that's gone through this, you can't help people, they have to help themselves. Um, uh, mental health, and then, but, but phys uh, science, we give, I give a fair amount of money to science, both like medical research, but also like uh, hard science. And that's, I would say that's the kind of the more fun areas. Um, you know, for example, I gave, I give some money to um, McDonald's Observatory uh, for a, one of their um, dark energy projects, trying to figure out what dark energy is. Uh, but, you know, and I, and we give money for research, like cancer and kind of stuff like that. But but I was like, okay, like what, what can I do that's like interesting? Like, you know, like, yes, we can contribute a little bit to helping cure cancer, but the government gives lots of money and like it's just gonna be a small bit. So but what's, what can I do that's like interesting? And I thought about it and I go, you know, what I hate the most is jet lag. Uh, you know, you, it like ruins my vacation. And so um, I found two labs to cure jet lag. And, uh, uh, and I thought, you yeah, know, no way, they're not gonna cure jet lag, but I can try and we'll see what happens. And, um, it turns, and it turns out they're making good progress. Like one of them is a University of um, Pittsburgh, and they uh, can replace the gene in, a gene in mice so that they don't get jet lag. So if you want gene replacement therapy, you can avoid jet lag. It's a little, it's a little bit extreme. <laughs> and then, <clears throat> um, uh, but the other one is in Texas A&M, and they're doing. They found compounds that that you can take pills that will help eliminate jet lag. So. Amazing. But I joke with them like they t when they because like they visit the lab and they the way they um, they they test these compounds on like mold, and, and it seem, which and it seems to work on mold. So then they start testing on mice. Seems to work on mice. So I'm like, okay, start testing on college students. That would, they'll be next. <laughs> um, 
you, you, you informed me uh, this week that you have a side project. You've been a uh, kind of a weekend uh, hackathon project. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, just so I like my hobbies, you know, I like to hike and, um, but I like to code, you know, that's, and I've been doing it a long time. And I, I, I go through phases, you know, not coding for a long time, or, um, but I'm doing a project right now um, for allowing me to take C++ code and run it in a web browser. So if anyone here is into coding and they want to get their C++ code or C code running in a web browser, you can check out my tiny WASM runtime on GitHub and try it out. So that's my project right now. How many, how many, uh, how many other people have downloaded it or touched it? I get 300 downloads a week. 300 downloads a week. Yeah. It's, not, it's not the next Roku, or maybe? Hey, I started out 300 a week. It's only, um, it's only been out for two or three weeks, so. Okay, fantastic. Um, what questions do you have for me? Uh, well, I was wondering what, you're a venture capitalist, you're a very successful venture capitalist, but <clears throat> what, what have you invested in or sorry, what have you seen? What was pitched to you that you did not invest in that you regret? Like, what are, what are your biggest regrets as an investor like that you did not invest in? So, I know one of the things you want to bring up in me answering this question is Roku. Um, <laughs> and I suspect that had I invested in Roku, I would have made a lot of money, but I might be able to top you because oh, yeah. I had, Larry and Sergey present when they had 25 employees. Oh wow! And we failed to chase that. So that's no, always that's, that's a pretty big mess. <laughs> and was that that's interesting? Was that because Yahoo was so big and like you? You know, it's interesting. I, I've I've thought about that uh, an, the answer to this question probably more times than you, you could imagine. Um, at the time, Yahoo had gone from 82 to 10 you know, in the public stock market. Excite was filing for bankruptcy. These are other search engines. And so, and I'm not saying that's the only reason, but th there wasn't as much enthusiasm in the product category at that moment in time. Um, the product was good. We were using the product, like I knew the product was good and we weren't really worried about the business model because GoTo already existed, which was Bill Gross's thing where he was, he had, literally was doing the, 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 the ad auction mm -hmm. already, and they yeah. stole that and ended up having to settle with Copy them yeah. over that. But, um, you know, you had two PhD founders who said they both wanted to be CEO forever, hmm. you know, and that kind of, there were a lot of things that would check a red flag checklist. Um, and then, and then. Um, That's a good story. You got, what was your Yeah, but you, you know what's, one? what's amazing? Because I think <clears> the, pun the right punchline is two of the greatest venture capitalists of all time did the deal. John Doerr and Mike Moritz did the deal. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even though you might be able to rationalize <laughs> that there was a, a cognitive reason to get to that outcome, um, you, there's no excuse because they, they found a way around it. <clears throat> so, and obviously, probably the biggest return of all time. Yeah. How much did they make, do you think, on that? Billions. I, I, don't, I don't know if, I wouldn't know the distribution dates, obviously, They're, but uh, yeah. What was your second biggest? Roku was the second biggest. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> well, I agree with that, so. Okay, yeah. cool. I think we can wrap it there. All right. Thank you so much. All right. I really Thank appreciate you. it. Anthony Wood. Thank, Thank you, you, sir.